I was, uh, I found out after the program was over on Tuesday that an article had been posted at jeffriddle.net. A challenge James White on apologetics and text criticism. It's short. Let me just read it to you and respond to it. Okay. I think this is important because one of the things that I will demonstrate tomorrow, and this should not be, this should not be, um, though there's a lot of language that is used by them right now that, well, if he's really a Reformed Baptist, and, and, and a lot of questioning um, what my beliefs really are. And I've seen this. It, it, is, it is a plague amongst confessionalists. You, you find a particular area of the confession where there is difference of opinion and perspective, all of a sudden that part of the confession becomes more important than any other part of the confession. And a difference of opinion that would never result in a difference of preaching and theology becomes enough to functionally question whether the other person is truly a believer, or at least truly uh, even with remotely within the bounds of confessionalism. Um, I've seen it happen. I could, could name the topics, uh, and, and it's, it's happened down the centuries. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm going to uh, play that tomorrow and deal with some of the assertions that were made there, and especially about uh, apologetics, engaging in apologetics, um, and issues like that. But this was posted before I finished the last program. A friend sent... Okay, oh, okay I'm sorry. And what, what this and what I'll play tomorrow will illustrate is that if Robert Trulove and Jeffrey Riddle define the primary spokespeople for this movement amongst Reformed Baptists right now, they have yet to hear. They have yet to open their ears to hear the substance of the strongest arguments against their position. Because it was plain to me in listening to the Q&A that they have not heard what I'm saying. So what have I said from the start? I have said that their side cannot produce a textual critical methodology that if applied to the manuscript tradition today could reproduce the TR. Any of my believing brothers or sisters in Christ who engage in textual criticism on a professional level, people who are involved in the production of the ECM, NA27, UBS, anyone at, at, at Munster, Birmingham, um, the new folks here at Phoenix Seminary. There's stuff going on right here. It's great to see the next generation really coming out. The, the new book that just, just came out on myths and mistakes and, and textual criticism. Um, so excited to see young, young, fresh minds and believers involved in this. It's very, very encouraging. All of them heard what I just said and fully understood it. It's not that difficult to understand. If you're going to say my textual critical methodology is true, then it needs to be, have something called consistency. You cannot define the term truth without using categories of consistency, whatever language you're speaking in. And my argument has been and will remain until refuted that if you have to use different standards depending upon what text you're looking at to derive your final text, this is a fundamental refutation of the truthfulness of your system because you have no consistency. When we, modern, non-TR trad, believing Christian men 
engage in doing textual criticism, when we analyze readings and manuscripts and say, uh, you know, the new little fragments that were just published over the past year that have added to the number of papyri that we have. When you analyze even those fragments, there is a methodology that is utilized that is supposed to be able to be reproduced in Birmingham and Munster and at the CSNTM and in South America and Asia and Africa and everywhere else. Because it's consistent. The CBGM is supposed to be consistent. Now, I'll tell you right now, CBGM maybe while still in process, but certainly after the ECM is finally completed, there will be a revision of it of necessity because it hasn't been analyzed yet by too many people outside. And I'm one of the people saying there needs to be more control, more mechanisms that allow us to do that kind of analysis. And of course, these guys will say, see, that shows it's you know, supercomputers, blah, 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 blah. Um, I'm, I'm really, hopefully, once I get back from this trip, sometime in early December, I, I'm hoping to have Peter Gurry on. We'll, we'll have a discussion of that. Uh, anyway, I'm going to have to clean up the, have to clean up that side of the <laughs> side of the room before I, there's some books have piled up over in the corner. Uh, but piles of books don't bother anybody. If it was other stuff, it'd be a problem. Anyways, they have heard my argument to be this, that if all copies of the TR were destroyed, that they couldn't reproduce the TR using their methodology. Oh, well, I... Okay, but why aren't you hearing what I'm actually saying? Because they just focus so far. Well, you couldn't destroy all the TRs. That's not going to happen. Blah, blah. No, the point is you don't have a consistent methodology. You're starting at the end of the process. You can't work backwards. And that's the whole point. If you're starting, if your starting point is the end of what was plainly in history a process, then just you know, just be up front and say, we're not going to even talk about manuscripts or anything, because it doesn't matter. We believe the TR is the re-inspiration of Scripture. Because that's what you believe. Just the King James only has to believe it. They take it one step farther. It's the King James. You say it's TR. If there are no readings, nowhere in the TR, if, if you can look at Ephesians 3.9 and recognize that the entire history of the Christian church read it one way, and you read it a different way, and you don't care, then you're a King James onlyist, except you're a TR onlyist. Same attitude. Same mindset. The re-inspiration of Scripture. So, anyway, we'll get into that. I'll let you hear for yourself. I'll play it. I will, I will, th those words will be heard many more times on this program than they will be heard in the, in the regular dist dist distribution channels that they have. Okay, here's, here's what it says. A friend sent me a copy of comments, apparently, posted today to Facebook by popular internet apologist, James White. I've written 12 times somewhere between eight and 12 times, more books, many of which are used as textbooks uh, around the English-speaking world. But I'm just a popular internet apologist. Well, yeah. No, there's, there's a, there's a very, very, very plain um, emphasis to try to say, hey, yeah, he's nobody. Doesn't matter how many Greek classes he taught at Golden Gate or Hebrew or stuff. That, 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 who cares? Uh, responding to the recent text and canon conference in which he began with the following bold and underlined added. And here's my, a portion of what I said. 
I've gotten through four plus hours of text and canon conference from last weekend. A great deal to talk about as time permits, but two things right now. First, to my fellow apologists who do not buy into TR onlyism and who seek to give a defense of the New Testament against atheists, Muslims, etc., in the public square, something that, to my knowledge, the TR only position has yet to attempt in any major way. Notice the context again clear. Um, Stephen Anderson, who, by the way, is dominating in posting on the Facebook page for the Text and Canon Conference. Just Stephen Anderson. Yes, stand in the pulpit, Stephen Anderson. Yelling, screaming, Stephen Anderson. He's all over it. Um, these guys don't under understand that. The text was... I'm talking to fellow apologists who are going into battle... You know, like, we'll eventually get to it. Honestly, it may seem like old news, but the subject isn't going to change. We'll eventually get to commenting on the Lycona Howe uh, debate. And we're going we're gonna to talk about Ehrman uh, on Unbelievable. We'll, we'll get to that stuff. Um, it's just a matter of trying to... Remember, I don't have a staff that does this. I, I do it myself. So... That's, that's why it takes a little time. Anyway, we'll get to all that stuff. That's what I'm talking about, is that level of discussion. You will need to tune into the arguments being put forward by the TR-only guys because they will be taken up and used against you by the atheists and Muslims. So you will have atheists and Muslims in particular quoting these guys in their favor against you. That's what I wrote. What was I referring to? Specifically, Jeffrey Riddle's attack upon the ability of the manuscript evidence, say, for the first 700 years, to provide us with a meaningful foundation for the establishment of the original text of the New Testament. He attacks that. He attacks the papyri. Uh, he attacks the early unseals. And for those who have engaged Bart Ehrman and engage his arguments, then you know how important that is. You know how central that is. And so if you have Christians fundamentally saying that what we have back then just isn't enough, we need to have something more. That is a re-inspiration of the text in the 16th century. That's what they're offering. But we need something more. That will be used. And so you need to be prepared for the minimalization of the importance of the earliest manuscripts of the New Testament, which Riddle presents so as to make room for the necessity of the Textus Receptus. Because if you can determine the New Testament text, Without the TR, that's a problem for their perspective. So whenever you're trying to bring in something else, you're going to attack anything that would keep it from taking the place that you want to put it in. And that's what they're doing. And so I recognized immediately that they could be, and here's the key, here's, here's what Dr. Riddle doesn't understand. They could be quoted in context correctly in light of their intended conclusions against us. Now, what's his response? Well, the Muslims use your stuff all the time. Not in correct context, not accurately using what I said and its intention. That's the difference. And it's so off. It seems, it seems childish to me, but I'm, I'm sorry to have to waste time to do it, but it came up in the Q&A. It comes up here. How many times? I, I, know of, I know of at least one video I've put out there where I took on Muslim by choice, and I said, you completely misunderstood what I was saying. You completely took it out of its context. You are not using it 
correctly at all. Now, I have said, Muslim by choice will put stuff out there where he actually plays enough of what I said that if a person wants to be honest, they'll know what I said. Now, he may not get it. He, he may not be hearing what I'm saying, but other people will. I at least appreciate that. He doesn't do the chop, 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 chop stuff where you cut a bunch of stuff out and make it say something completely different. So I'll give him that, give him that much. But I am well aware of the fact that Muslims, when I argue against bad arguments that are used against them, they'll quote me, as well they should. I have no problem with that at all. If they are accurately quoting what I'm saying, I have no problem with that at all. But the difference here is that they will be able to quote Jeffrey Riddle in his context and with the intention of fundamentally degrading the value and importance of the earliest manuscripts of the New Testament because he is seeking to promote tr onlyism The Muslims cannot do that with me if they are going to be quoting what I'm saying on whatever topic then they're either going to be quoting me saying something that is truthful but has nothing to do with the truthfulness of Christianity, or they're going to be misunderstanding what I'm saying. But what I was saying was they can truthfully utilize what the TR trads are saying to attack the very materials that have been providentially provided to us. Yes, God gave us the papyri, gentlemen, and he preserved them. And what do they demonstrate? They demonstrate the connection between, and I'm speaking specifically of the second century, early third century papyri, the direct connection between them and the unseals. No editing, no changing, no taking entire things out, putting in new doctrines, all the rest of this stuff. And as I've pointed out, and I haven't finished listening to it, but I truly doubt there's going to be any touching on stuff like this. When you have the conjunction between P75 and Vaticanus in a unique reading, this demonstrates that reading goes back to the early 2nd century. And that means within 50 years which for a work of antiquity is astonishing. And given the multiple lines of transmission would mean that all the theories that say that there was this version over here and that version over there and this type of there, that, that fall apart based upon actual documentable information rather than just simply theoretical speculation, which is all these guys have. They are literally saying that the early church had the TR. That's what they're literally saying. And no one who is doing Bible translation work, or anything, no one in the academy that I know of believes that. I, I don't know of a single person. They're still digging up Ted Letus and Edward F. Hills, their materials. Listen, I'll play it if you want me to. They were asked about books. Theodore Letus, Edward F. Hills, it's the stuff that's been around for decades now. It's all they've really got because the people actually working in the field, because see, remember, they're not working in the field because there's no field to work in. Uh, one of the fascinating questions that was asked was, should we even value Greek New Testament manuscripts today? It's a good question, isn't it? I mean, I bet you were sitting there going, you know, sort of, sort of, sort of halfway listening to me, and then now you're like, well, should we? Because just automatically assumed. You know, I mean, um, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but I regularly support, personally, CSNTM, and I'd recommend it to you too. What's CSNTM? Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts. What are they doing? They're running around the world, uh, getting Dan Wallace huge amounts of frequent flyer miles. Um, <laughs> To, to digitize Greek manuscripts. Well, let's be honest. 
if you buy this TR only stuff, that is a waste of time and money. It has been since at least 1633. It's been a waste since 1633. Everything has been done. All the cataloging of the manuscripts and all the initially the microfilming that they did years and years and years ago. It was just horrible. Uh, but hey, that's all they had. Microfilming and now digitizing and the cataloging and everything going on in Munster and everything going on in Birmingham and up in Michigan and, and uh, uh, down at New Orleans, uh, the CNTTS, all that stuff is an absolute total waste of time. It's irrelevant. And I sit here and go, that's exactly what the King James only guys say about all Bible translations too. It's the same mindset. It's just one step removed. It's a different reading list. It's the same mindset. Why should you bother even being, why should any of us have cared about first century Mark, which turned out to be second or third century Mark? Why? why? It doesn't matter. We know exactly what Mark said from their perspective, providentially. And if you're a Calvinist, you really believe that. Now, they seriously want to argue that that's exactly what the confession meant. I seriously think they are seriously wrong. It is grossly anachronistic. Now, were there people in the next couple of centuries that ended up going that far because they were pushed that far by Rome? Yep, and they were wrong. W-R-O-N-G with a capital W. In fact, you might want to capitalize the R while you're at it. But just because people before us have made mistakes in argumentation doesn't mean that we have to live and die by their mistakes. Is that really what Semper Reformanda means? I thought Reformanda was an active form. This position turns Reformanda into a completed form. Somebody who's really good with Latin, tell me what the... Uh, perfect would be for that verbal root. I was going to look it up, honestly, but I've got other things to do. <laughs> There's no semper reformanda here. There is establishment of tradition. Do not question it. That's what you have. So my response to Dr. Riddle is, um, I, I don't need to, I, I did not say that they have already done so. I, what I have said is there are individuals who are very sharp, who are critics, and you have provided them a contextually. And, and as I said, Dr. Riddle's discussion of the papyri was grossly biased, very shallow and easily refuted, but only by those who've been working with papyri for a while and know the relationship of the readings between the papyri and the unseals. And that's not a large group of people. And most of them just are not even thinking about this stuff. So, especially when it comes to apologists, hey, who is the one guy that has criticized his own tribe for years over one thing? How many leading apologists are Biblical language capable. I've never understood that. I've never understood why so few are. To me, it's one of the most basic skills that you need to, you need to possess. And so when I speak to my fellow apologists, I'm telling them, look out, this is coming. You need to be prepared to interact with this kind of perspective. And that's all I was doing there. I stand by it. I think it's very clear. Um, I don't need to provide any videos because I didn't say it already happened. I'd said that it most likely will. And the difference between the misuse, when, when, when they're quoting me and misusing it as an argument's Christianity, that's different. When they're quoting me where I'm correcting a bad argument against Islam, I've been doing that for a long, long time. We started doing that with Mormonism a long time ago. 
we did not make ourselves popular when we would address arguments that were that were very popular amongst the big boys against Mormonism, and we said, nah, I don't think so. Not consistent. Um, so that's the way we are because there's this truth thing. Again, it's just really important. You, you, there's no reason to do this if you don't believe that. If you don't believe that. 